I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 15 as we continue our series uh, titled Way Out. Uh, in 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortez landed in the Veracruz, uh, the, the Yucatan area of Veracruz. And you probably know this story. You know the story historically about how uh, Cortez absolutely decimated the Aztec Empire. Uh, through a brutal process of colonialization, he, there was so much genocide, there was so much terrible attack on the Aztec people. And so uh, just speaking of Cortez in that context, there should be no statues built, there should be no legacy, there should be no applause for Hernan Cortez in what he did. But there was one notable part of this adventure that should, we should keep in mind, and that is, and you've heard us probably talk about it before here at, at Central Bible Church, when the 600 men that came with Cortez to the Yucatan, when they were ferried ashore off of their ships, Cortez commanded that 10 of the 11 ships that they traveled on be destroyed out in the bay. In fact, presumably they were all burned. And the reason is that Cortez wanted to communicate to all of the people that had come with him that in the, at the adventure that we're on, we're going to move, the, move ahead. We're not going to turn back. There's no turning back. Burn the ships. And that's an important spiritual principle. It's a discipleship principle for us as the people of God. Because Jesus himself said that no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What Jesus was communicating to his disciples then and his disciples today is that God has called us into an adventure with himself. We are going to move ahead and we're not going to look back. We're going to burn the ships. We're not going to turn back to our old life. And that is such an important principle for us to remember every single day. It's the principle that is communicated to us in this passage that we look at, a rather lengthy passage, Exodus, the end of chapter 15, all of chapter 16, and the first part of chapter 17. Now let's remember where we have come. Last week, we walked with the people of God through the Red Sea. They have made their escape. They have found a way out of Egypt. And they not only left Egypt, but they arrived on the other side of, this, of, this, of the Red Sea, and they have left behind oppression, and they have left behind bondage, and they have left behind poverty, and they've left behind hopelessness. In fact, the Red Sea crossing for the Jewish people in the Old Testament is, in a sense, their story of salvation. You know, we look to the cross in the New Testament as the greatest story of salvation, but for the Jewish people, this was their story of salvation. And so they've made it to the other side. Egypt is in the rearview mirror. And as they travel, the Bible tells us at the end of chapter 15 that Moses led the people for three days into the desert of Shur where they found no water. We read in chapter 15, verse 24. So what did the people do? They grumbled against Moses saying, what are we supposed to drink? I think that's the tone that the passage has. The Bible says that about a month later, they continued eastward. They're unhappy with their provisions. And so we read in chapter 16 that in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. And then that wasn't the only time. As we press on further eastward, the people of God come to Rephidim. And we read in chapter 17 that the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why? Why in the world did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? You see the pattern? Three times. It says that the people, first in the desert is sure, and then in Rephidim, a little further past that point, what happened? The people grumbled. In fact, nine times in this passage, it says the people grumbled. The Hebrew word here means to growl. They moaned and they complained. They were so discontent with their circumstances. This is not the first time. In fact, the grumbling started on the other side 
of the Red Sea. As the people stood on the shore of the Red Sea and they could see water ahead of them and war behind them, the Bible tells us in chapter 14 that they turned to Moses and they said, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Really? Really? I mean, Moses is going, I, I beg your pardon? Yeah, we were better off in Egypt because in Egypt we had water. And in Egypt we had meat. And in Egypt we had our own homes. And in Egypt we even had plenty of places to, to bury our dead if we wanted to. Why haven't you let us stay in Egypt? Before we start throwing stones at the people of God several thousand years ago. Let's take a look at our own lives. Because I think there's, there's a temptation in us as the people of God in this generation to, to look back. You see, you can begin your adventure with God. You placed your faith. Maybe some of you as young children, like we've seen the children today, or maybe you came to faith much later in life. And along the way, you looked at this adventure with God, this trek with God out of the old life and into a life of promise. And you had so much hope. You imagined that the life with God into the future was just going to go into the promised land and everything was going to be beautifully perfect. And then what happened? You came into the desert. You discovered that the spiritual life, just like all of life, can be pretty challenging at times because, because Christians lose their job and Christians get cancer and Christians endure unfaithful spouses. Christians wrestle with mental illness. Christians are treated unfairly. My wife showed up to church today. She came down. She's a little bit late. I said, you're a little bit late. I didn't actually say that, but I, I thought it. She said, have you looked at your phone in the last half hour? I said, no, I haven't looked at my phone. She goes, I had a flat tire. She got in her car today. She had a flat tire. Christians get flat tires. It's what happens. And sometimes the new life, the new life in Christ that we expect to be just so incredible and wonderful and fantastic. Along the way, we hit a desert's place, a place that's bare and a place where we, where we suddenly realize, you know what? This is not quenching my thirst. This is not satisfying my hunger. And so instead of burning the ships... We turn back and we start, we start looking back to Egypt. People do it. You've, you've done it. I've done it. It's a pretty common thing. We start looking back to Egypt. And that's the reason that you have seen people around you. Maybe you've even discovered it in your own life. That people will sometimes turn back to a toxic relationship. And you're like, why would you do that? Why would you go back to your old haunts? Why would you turn back and open the bottle again? Why would you turn back to your addiction? Why would you go back to porn? Why would you go back to find a fix? Why would you start the gossiping all over again? Why would you, why would you start lying again? Why would you start being so boastful or cynical again? Why would, you, why would you return to materialism, start filling your life with just all of this junk that you don't need? Why would you do that? The answer is because you've forgotten what Egypt was really all about. My daddy used to say, you got a good memory, it's just short. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's pretty true of us. We've, we've left this old life, and then along the way, stuff starts getting a little harder, it gets, starts getting a little dull, or we start getting a little thirsty, we start getting a little hungry, and suddenly we, we look back and we, we think, well, the satisfaction and the fullness is really found back there. It's not found back there. we got good memory, it's just short. And this may be speaking to where some of you are at today. Maybe you've been, maybe you've, you've half turned back to Egypt. You've been living life in this direction, but along the way, over the last couple of months, you're like, I am, what a, and you've begun to turn. Maybe some of you have already turned. Maybe some of you have already found yourself back in the patterns of the old life. Before you settle back in Egypt, before you turn back to Egypt, let me remind you of two universal, timeless principles. You have to consider these two principles. Number one, our old life is puke. <laughs> I, I changed that point this morning. I had Phil. I said, oh, let's change it. Let's just say it this way. Our old life 
is puke. Say that with me, puke. Good, you said it. You said it in church. It's a good morning. If you're taking notes this morning, you write down Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats its folly. That's in your Bible. It's right there. It is blunt, it's visual, and it's disgusting. And if you've ever had a dog, you have seen this repulsive behavior in your pet. Let me explain to you how it happens. The dog... It's not like we're going to have a video. But here's what happens. Along the way, your dog eats something that it thinks it's food, but its body realizes this has no nutritional value. This is not food. It's foreign. It must be thrown up. Get rid of it out of your body. And so the dog does that. And then almost instantly, that strange animal turns around to its foul regurgitation and thinks that it's food. And you watch that and you think, what is wrong with our pet? But then again, we do the same thing. Because we have a life that at some point in meeting Jesus Christ and coming into a relationship with him, it occurred to us, it was revealed to us, the Spirit of God led us to realize that this old life is not food. It's it's foul and foreign stuff that ought to be given up. It ought to be thrown up out of our life. It must be done away with. But along the way, we've, we've not remembered that it, it, it's not provision, it's puke. And we turn back to those things. And we turn back and we think our drugs, our drug habit is provision. It's not provision, it's puke. We think our alcohol is provision. It's not provision, it's puke. We think our promiscuity is provision. It's not provision, it's puke. We think our gambling is gonna actually meet our needs. We're gonna get something for nothing. It's puke. We think our cheating, that we're fudging, our lying a little bit is gonna actually save the day and rescue us and make us feel better. It's not provision, it's puke. We think that our dog-eat-dog disposition where we bow up and we show our, show our, work, our co-workers who's boss and that we're, we think that's provision. That's not provision. It's puke. We think manipulating the numbers or manipulating relationships is going to end up saving the day. It's not provision. It's puke. That's what we do. We, we see what we threw up in the old life and we turn around to it and we think, well, that's, that's delicious. It's not. Let me give you a real practical example. It used to be that the people of God expressed their devotion to God by coming to church, hung out together, worship God every Sunday. But along the way, over the last couple of decades especially, and COVID didn't help, people have begun to just migrate away from church, just migrate, staying home doing something else. In fact, I told you this before, but the average attendance before COVID was that a regular attendee attended church two out of five Sundays. That was considered regular attendance. And you go, why, why would people, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, okay, but just bear with me. Why do people stay home? I'm not talking about medical necessity because of COVID because they have a compromised immune system. That's not, if you're listening to this, you're watching from home, that's not what I'm talking about. Let me tell you what happens along the way. We kind of, we just kind of go, I want to do something else. I'm kind of in a desert. I'm kind of hungry for something else, thirsty for something else. And what happens is that we begin to fill that time with a golf game. I've heard people say, couldn't come to church, had to clean the house. We've got company coming on Wednesday. (laughs) True story. Uh, You know, we're going to have family time. We're going to have family time together. That sounds so noble. We, we, we just, I just need some me time. I need to recharge. The week's been so busy. I just need some me time. Or, or think about this. Wouldn't all of you like to be sitting here with a plate of bacon? Sitting in your jammies. That's right. Bacon next week. Sitting in your jammies. Watching the service so that you can actually multitask and get your quartal and your sudoku done for the day in the middle of church. And here's what has happened. Let me just tell you what has happened. This is a reality. The reality is that we are have have thought along the way something clicked in our minds where self-indulgence 
seem to be more satisfying than self-sacrifice. Self-indulgence, we look back and we thought, playing golf, doing my own time, doing my own thing, having some me time, sitting with bacon, multitasking, doing my life actually seems more satisfying, more filling than actually coming together with the people of God and bowing my life and my heart before the living God and telling him how much I love him and connecting with God's people. But listen, church, listen carefully. It was self-indulgence that got us into trouble in the beginning. It was self-indulgence. It was thinking of my life as just for me and doing whatever I wanted in life that actually separated me from God. It wasn't until I met Jesus Christ and realized that God, a God-centered life, is more fulfilling. I find greater purpose. I find all of my needs met, that life is more beautiful being focused on him. I've forgotten about that. I forget about that. You forget about that. And there's a lot of people not sitting in churches that used to sit in churches that have forgotten about that. And we have turned back to Egypt and we think, hmm, Let's just go do that instead and forget, forget that Egypt is puke. It's not provision. Romans chapter 6, Paul states it so plainly. Listen to this simple, these two simple verses. He says, when you were slaves to your sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Now, that sounds like good news, but it's not. He says, you basically had no obligation to do anything good. What benefit did you reap from the time, at that time, from the things that you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Paul says, you want to look back to the old life, to the old addiction, to the old good-for-nothing relationships, You want to look back to your own self-centeredness, your own laziness, your own materialism. You want to look back to Egypt and think that it actually offered something. Let me just remind you, Paul says, of three dangers of that old life. I I just want to sober you up for just a minute and remind you of the puke of that old life. Three words. Number one, slavery. The old life offers you nothing but bondage and oppression and addiction. Satan is your pharaoh. He puts you under his thumb and you are subjected to his service. Slavery. Number two, it offers you only shame. Because let me tell you the terrible cycle that all of us experience. We dabble in sin. We suddenly feel guilty and ashamed of our sin. And what does a person do when they feel guilty or ashamed? They look for something to make themselves feel better. And you know what makes you feel better? Sin. And so you dabble in sin, and then you wake up one morning and realize that's not the way I should be living, and you feel so ashamed of yourself. So what do you do when you feel ashamed of yourself? You look for something to make you feel better, and what makes you feel better? Yeah, it's a vicious cycle where you live your life in shame, slavery, shame, separation. Because the wages of sin is death. And when we begin to depart from the way of God, we lose connection from him and life and peace and fulfillment and purpose and all the things that God offers his people who will just follow him. Slavery, shame, separation. That's what you can find in Egypt. That's what waits for you. Every single one of us, it waits for us in Egypt. Whenever I think about this idea, I, my, my mind is taken to C.S. Lewis, who in The Weight of Glory, that's a, a beautiful book, Lewis says it this way. He says, our Lord, our God, finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Don't miss it, church. Egypt is nothing but bondage and brokenness, and only a foolish dog would return to what is puke. That's the first principle. The old life is puke. Second principle, God gives us so much better. He gives you and me, 
so much better. Let's go back to our text today. Three episodes, the end of chapter 15, all of chapter 16, the first part of chapter 17. There are three episodes. And in each episode, this is what we see. We see that God hears his people. He hears their cries. He sees their dilemma. He knows things were hard. And beautifully in these texts, God responds. He responds. In chapter 15, the people traveled for several days beyond the Red Sea. They came to this place that they would later call Mara, but the water was rank. The, the water was bitter. It was so nasty that people couldn't drink it. But the Lord made the bitter water sweet so that the people would, would receive a provision from the Lord. They traveled on from that place. They began to get hungry. They had plenty of water. Now they, their stomachs were growling. And so God, in a, beautiful, in a beautiful demonstration of his faithfulness, God met their need. He gave them quail during the evenings. I mean, quail just dropped out of the sky and were on the desert floor. You could catch the quail with your hands so that the people had meat to eat in the evening. And then when they woke up in the morning, there was this, there was this seed, there was this stuff from heaven, this foreign stuff from heaven that covered the desert floor called manna. Literally, what is it? I don't know. And they had all of the quail and all of the bread that they needed for 40 years until they reached the promised land. God provided And then in chapter 17, as the people are moving on, now they're thirsty again. Got to have something to drink, got to have something to eat, got to have something to drink again. The people are thirsty. And God tells Moses, take the rock that's over there, strike it with your staff. And out of the rock flowed water so that the entire community were cared for. God provided them sweet water. God provided them quail and manna. God provided them water from the rock. And what I love about these three back-to-back provisions is that it was clear God was taking care of his people. It wasn't that the people just needed to walk a little further and then they'd find water. It wasn't that they just needed to learn the discipline of fasting and then they'd be okay with with less food. It wasn't that they needed to gather all of the civil engineers together and try to figure out where do you find water? Well, it's going to be under bedrock if we strike these rocks. It wasn't that their, their intellect could solve their problem. But at each place along the way, when they hit a rough patch, they turn to the Lord, and the Lord miraculously provided. But while we see that the Lord is providing beautifully and faithfully and miraculously for his people, we shouldn't miss in each one of these texts that it required the people's obedient faith to lay hold of what God provided. At each step along the way, As the people grumbled, God provided. But as God provided, the people had to be faithful. They had to walk forward in what God was providing to lay hold of what God was doing for them. Let's go back to each one of these episodes, okay? It's really, it's interesting what happens. They come to the first spot, what would later be called called Merah, which means bitter. And the water was bitter. In fact, in verse 25, we read, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now, let's just pause for just a minute. If I'm Moses, I feel kind of silly, because there is no wood in the universe that makes bitter water sweet. So the people lap some of this water, and they go, that's terrible, we're not going to... Drink that. Lord says to Moses, see that log over there? Moses goes, yeah. Throw it in there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Struck a couple of his buddy to pick up this piece of wood and throw it in the water. Why did God do that? Well, because verse 26 says this. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and you do what is right in his eyes, not in your eyes, but you do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, if you keep all of his decrees, then I'll not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. You see what God was saying to Moses and the people? You want my best, you're going to have to be obedient. I want you in faith to just trust me. 
You do what I command you to do, and then you will discover my provision and my best. It, my best is not found back there. My best is found forward, but it's through faithful obedience. Episode number one. Episode number two, the people are hungry. We're so hungry, we've got enough to drink, but now we don't have enough to eat. And so they're crying out to Moses, they're crying out to the Lord, and God prov provides quail that lands on the, gr on, the, on the ground, but then he provides this strange, what is it, on the ground when they come out of their tents the next morning. I want to know the name of the first guy that said, let's put some of this in our mouth. It's kind of like beets. You know my affection for beets. I'm like, who, who pulled this out of the ground and said, this looks delicious? And yet God gave his people very specific commands. When you come out of your tents in the morning, take and gather enough from your, for your family. Do it every single day. Don't gather too much because it'll rot. And oh, by the way, the day before the Sabbath, collect twice as much because on the Sabbath, there won't be any on the ground. And the people of God had to decide whether they would follow the Lord. In fact, in verse 16, 4, it says, I will test them and I will see whether they'll follow my instructions. I mean, let's face it. God could have just provided food and it had been ordinary food and just landed in their refrigerators every morning, right? But God was going, no, I'm gonna see if day in and day out you will follow the specific directions I've given you. No more, no less. And then the last episode, the people are thirsty again. And God says to Moses, strike the rock. Once again, if I'm Moses, I'm going, Lord, this does not. The people are looking for water. They need water. That's what they need. Not a drum beat. They need water. God goes, Moses, just obey. Just be faithful. Trust me, Moses. And reach out and take the thing that I'm going to provide you by faith. Along the way of our relationship with God, church, we're going to find ourselves in the desert. There are going to be some times where we're kind of thirsty, we're kind of hungry, because the Christian life, the adventure with God is sometimes hard. We have a decision to make. We can turn back and look at Egypt and go, you know what, let's just drift back to the life, the old life that was before. Or we can say, you know what, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to do what he said. And I'm going to walk in faithful obedience to his commands. I've got four questions I want to leave you with today. As we think about this passage, four questions. The first question is this. What is behind you that still calls out to you? What of the old life that was really nothing but bondage and brokenness and oppression, what of that old life still whispers your name and says, come on. Come on back, there's, there's, this is good. This is so good, you've forgotten. Is there an addiction? Is there a relationship? Is there a disposition of your life that still wants to lure you? Maybe it does lure you on occasion back to Egypt. I think it's important that we be honest with ourselves. Go, okay, this thing that I find myself caught up in, that's That's Egypt. That's puke. That, that's the old life. The second question is this. What do you really think it offers you? What, is it, what does it claim that it can bring into your life that's better than life in Christ? You know, there's an episode in Homer's Odyssey where the sirens not on top of police cars. The sirens were half woman, half bird creatures that sang out these luring chants, these enchanting songs and music to sailors that were on the ocean. The sailors would have to plug up their ears so that they didn't listen to the siren calls. But to the sailors that didn't plug up their ears, they were lured by the music and they would direct their ships over and the siren call would lure the sailors where their ships would absolutely be torn apart by the rocks of Scylla. 
there was nothing but catastrophe that waited ahead. And for you and I to turn around and to look into Egypt and to venture back, maybe just a little Egypt over here, a little Egypt over there. Listen, it will overpromise and underdeliver. Satan will always overpromise and underdeliver to your life. There is no good thing that waits for you in Egypt. And I think you and I need to be sober enough to really count the cost and to, and to be aware of what the siren call of Egypt offers up and, and then remember that it can never deliver for us. The third question is this. What command, what command of God have you yet to obey? Now, I'll be honest with you. It, it doesn't take long for me if I sit down and I really think about my adventure with God. It doesn't take long for me to realize there are just some pieces of life with God that, that I've not yet yielded to him. I've not yet said, Lord, you know what? Part of the reason that I'm not discovering all of the good life that you offer me is because I'm, I'm still dabbling over here. I've not yet fully surrendered that to you. And church, I think we have to take inventory of our lives and, and see what of Egypt have we brought along with us? What have we failed to really let go of? And instead, and, 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 and rather, what are the commands of God? Is there, is there a discipline that I've yet to form in my life? Or is there a relationship that I've yet to go to and try to be reconciled with? Or is there a sacrifice or a surrender that I've not yet let go of and said, Lord, you can really have all of me? Or is there a commitment that I've not yet been willing to make? Or is there a conversation that maybe you've not been willing to have yet? Is there a yes that's been lingering out there, and you know it, you would know it, maybe somebody else wouldn't be able to see that in your life, but you know there's a yes, there's something out there that you've just not yet said, Lord, you can have all of me. What is that, what is that command that you've yet to obey? And then fourthly, how is God's greatest provision in Jesus better? Because I'll just go ahead and tell you the punchline, it is better. Jesus is always better. In fact, when we look at these three episodes, in fact, we see Jesus written all over it. If you don't yet know Jesus Christ, let me tell you who he is plainly. He is the one who comes into a bitter life. He throws the wood of his cross into that person's life and he makes it sweet because he dies for sinner. Jesus Christ is the true bread, the manna from heaven who God has provided for the sustenance of our eternal life. Jesus Christ is the rock that was struck for you and struck for me and from him flows living water so that you and I might drink and might find our ultimate satisfaction in him. Jesus Christ is better. And if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, there is an invitation. God sees the growl and the groaning and the moaning and, the, and he sees the brokenness of your life. Maybe he's, like not maybe, he sees it better than you see it. And he's made a provision that is much better than the life you're presently living. He's given the provision of Jesus who is bread and water and sweet life. And today you can begin new life, the adventure with God, heading toward a life of promise, turning away from the Egypt that is behind you. And I can assure you, it is a life which is far better. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life, you may have it to the full, a much better life than the life you're presently living. And you can have new life in Jesus very simply. Let me tell you how. By recognizing that he is the Son of God, the sacrifice that has been sent to free you from your sin and to place your faith in Him. That's it. Jesus, I realize that you're the Son of God. You are my Savior. Would you take my sin and give me 
eternal life. Do you know that you can do that right where you sit, right here in this worship center, online, if you're sitting in your living room, that you can right now bow your head and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm, I'm ready to get out of Egypt. I'm ready to go into the land of promise. I need you. I will place my faith in Jesus Christ right now and discover the best that you have for me. And church, if you do that, you will discover, because there's lots of people sitting here that will tell you, that God's greatest provision for your life and mine is Jesus. And so let me just offer a summary of where we've been today. We discover God's best by walking forward in obedient faith rather than foolishly turning back to Egypt. We discover God's best by just pressing ahead, trusting him, walking faithfully obedient in faith rather than turning back foolishly to Egypt. So burn the ships. Burn the ships. There's nothing in the past that's worth anything. In the words of that great hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you know the chorus? No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I'll burn the ships. No turning back. Let's pray together. Our Father, today, by your Spirit, you have given us a challenge. The challenge is to trust you for what is best. To realize that we came out of Egypt. There's nothing that holds sway. There's nothing of any benefit back in Egypt. And so what we need, Lord, is the the willingness and the courage to trust you and to just keep pressing ahead, walking forward in faith. I pray, Lord, for the person that's here that has found themselves half-turned toward Egypt. They've been lured by the siren call of some some addiction, some uh, temptation, some enchantment enchantment that's in the past. Lord, would you remind them that the old life is only puke and that life with you is always a better provision? And then, God, would you give us the fortitude to stay the course. Stop looking back. Start looking forward to trust in Jesus, not just once in our life when we were 11, but to trust in Jesus day after day after day. And then, God, we will discover your best for us in Christ. We thank you for it, and we pray it in his name. Amen.